the Gospels. So as we approach them, I want to give you two scripture texts that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So we're approaching the Gospels and all scripture for that matter, not just to accumulate knowledge, but to know Christ in a deeper way. And we approach the Gospels uh, with a, just a, a specific historical context in mind. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So uh, this is the time period of what we call the progressive revelation where the incarnation has occurred, and this is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, as we know it. Your lecture source material, contents and quotes, are coming from your textbook, and I want to mention that again. Today we'll be dealing with chapter 7, uh, the Gospels, one story, many dimensions. So we're going to be em emphasizing the many dimensions. Now... <laughs> I, I hope you read the chapter, not once, twice, but even three times if you could, uh, because it's a difficult text, there's a lot of information in it, and it can be a bit daunting, but if you'll remember the first law of learning, I don't know. That's the first law of learning. So when you approach something, and you study it and you read it and you say, you know what, I really don't know this. I need to pursue it. But if you approach it uh, again with the mindset that says, well, you know, I know all about this, shut the book. That's, that's bad, okay? That's not our approach. We approach humbly. Study to show thyself approved unto God, workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So as we launch into this lesson, I just want to remind you, that we already have some acquired Bible study skills taken from the study of the epistles, uh, taken from the narratives. So things like background, theme, outline, paragraphs, character, plot, resolution, etc. Uh, these are skills that we've already talked about. And I, I hope that they didn't float away, but you're just processing them. So as we approach this lesson, the focus is to look at some of these dimensions of the, of the Gospels. Um, for example, um, the, the, the dimension of a background or cultural studies or structure. There's many more that we're going to look at, and uh, what we want to do is uh, help you accumulate them and put them in your repertoire of the way you approach the text. Second, I am going to stress helpful resources. Now, we do have the dean of this class in here, so at, after this statement, he has the opportunity to push me out the door if he wants. But I am not a purist in what I mean by this. When I study, obviously sometimes I just read the Bible for the Bible, and I do, yes, absolutely, and meditatively ask God to speak to me. But in this category, when I say I am not a purist, I think it's naive to think that you can accumulate methodical Bible study skills without lots of resources. And the reason I say that is because few of us are masters of language and understanding it without help. I can read, but boy, you start going into grammar, syntax, literary techniques, uh, structure, background, all that sort of thing, I need help. So I'm not ashamed to say that we're, we're going to emphasize these techniques, but I'm also going to be channeling you to resources that will help you develop, okay? Because it is a misnomer to just come in purely and say that, well, I can develop these skills and uh, I won't need any resources per se initially. I, I think that's a fallacy in my own opinion. And then third, we will lay out a potential scheme of approaching the Gospels at the conclusion. So remember... As, as we pursue this class, hermeneutics, the science of Bible study, under that is methodical Bible study. So we're, we're learning how to observe. We're learning how to interpret. We're learning how to correlate, and we're learning how to apply. So we're learning how to observe. 
We're learning how to interpret what we observe. And then we're putting it in this cup here, my head, uh, my brain, as part of our Christian worldview so that we're studying the scriptures and then arriving at a Christian worldview and then we're applying it. Remember the meta-narrative, okay? And what is that? Uh, this is critical to all our studies. The meta-narrative of the scripture is creation, the fall of man, the promise of redemption, the incarnation, the second coming, consummation, okay? Where does the particular entity that we're studying fit in to the whole scheme, the meta narrative? And here, as the Gospels, they, they fit in for the most part between the first and second coming, although there's eschatological material referring to the second coming. But historically, we would say that it fits in between the incarnation. It is, uh, well, we have the chronologies, and then we have the birth narratives, and then it concludes with uh, the resurrection. So that fits in between what we would say he is the first coming and the second coming. So that's very critical because as we, as we unpack it, the theology of it will, will fit it in there. So remember that. Remember progressive revelation, all right? More light, more light, more light comes through more study. More light does not come through passivity, okay? Passivity meaning just uh, perhaps constant meditation with an empty mind. That does nothing. But as we engage the text and learn to study it, more light comes because our opinion of inspiration is the historical grammatical approach. That Spirit of God superintended this uh, gathering of the canon uh, very scrupulously, down to the grammar, in my opinion. So, if you want further information on that, studies in canon, Michael Kruger, all right, and I'll be mentioning his name. And throughout the course of this lecture, I will be making many allusions to various references. Progressive revelation, more understanding, okay? So, the Gospels, who is Jesus, what did he do, and what's my response, okay? So, the Gospels, who is Jesus, what did he do, what's my response? Now... I have to make a qualification here that as I approach this, I am an amateur, all right, in canonicity and uh, many of the aspects of understanding the science of hermeneutics in this category. Uh, so I make no apologies for that, uh, but there's plenty, plenty of good resources, as I just uh, previously mentioned, uh, Michael Kruger. So first thing we're going to do now is look at some of the distinctives of the gospel. And what I mean... Uh, distinctives are just their characteristics of, of what type of literature they are. And interwoven in that, I'm going to give you some advice on approaching this. But before we even go that direction, I, I want to make a pitch for what I consider a very neglected aspect of study regarding the Gospels, and that is what we call the harmony of the Gospels. Now, if you have a study Bible, uh, and I have one here, a Ryrus study Bible, there's various kinds, but uh, there's usually a section that takes the Gospels, and there's columns, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then it arranges the events somewhat chronologically. It's close, and what I mean by that uh, for example, I'm reading in the first section from my harmony from the Rari Study Bible, the genealogies. Well, Matthew and Luke have those. The birth of John announced to Zacchaeus. Luke has that. Uh, the birth of Jesus to Mary at Nazareth six months later. Luke has that. So this is extremely critical in your understanding of the Gospels, the, the progression of the narrative. And why do I say that? Well, 
because we're, we're studying in the gospel. And as your book said, it's not a complete biography. It contains biographies, biography, particularly of Jesus. But what you want to get in your thinking as you open your Bible and you, and you look at the four gospels, you're thinking, okay, this, this is a narrative in the sense that it goes from the chronologies that substantiate the his, historicity of Jesus Christ to the resurrection. So as I look at that, there's lots of events in between and teachings. So I want to be able to look down that corridor and to some degree be able to put them together chronologically. And the reason we do that, because it has very strong theological consequences. Let me say that again. I, I want to be able to put them along the line. Chronologically means so in a, in a time movement as it unfolds. And it's not perfect, okay? Uh, I'm the first one to admit my understanding of it. But here, here's a, um, a classic example. The new birth, as I've often mentioned, is John 3. And uh, I would ask myself, where does this fit in the narrative? It is Jesus' first major teaching, believe it or not. Okay? Now, that is not, that teaching is not reflected in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The concept's there, but the teaching is not officially there in that sense in a confrontation with Nicodemus. So why is that so critical theologically? Well, most people uh, would go very quick to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, and say, well, here, here's really the core of Jesus' teaching. This is, this is what you've got to get if you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, to some degree that's true, but that, that section is very late in Jesus' ministry, according to chronology. It's between the second and third Passover. And the intention for that section is to prove to the audience, the Pharisees, what real religion is. And that's why you have the, the blessed R's, right? And the first one, what blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning the humble who will engage salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. So my, my point on this and, and just driving this home right from the beginning is how critical, how critical this idea of understanding the harmony of the Gospels, all right? And again, you, you probably have one in your study Bible, if you have one. Uh, every time I preach or teach, per se, from the Gospels, I always go there first and say, all right, I've done my homework, but this is, this is where this event fits in. And then, consequently, I exegete it, but it's very, very theologically significant. So here again, try, try, to, try to really wrap your head around this, that as you study the gospel, the movement of the story interwoven with the teachings, it's very critical, uh, having some general understanding of the timeline. Matthew's gospel uh, as we'll look at briefly, just the, the theme of it, the Messiah, King Jesus, but it has a very, uh, let's just say, pinnacle in it when the nation of Israel officially rejects Jesus Christ. So there's a turn of events there. So that, that's, that's just skimming the surface to understanding what I'm getting at here, the harmony of the Gospels. Lots of good ones. I'll give you references later but I encourage you to be a student of that. Second distinctive, um, Jesus did not write the Gospels, okay? He did not write them. In fact, the uh, usus loquendi, I think that's the right word, was Aramaic, but they, they were written in Greek for the most part, um, and they're very similar. We have three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which we call the synoptic gospels, and that's the same view. Material is not all exactly the same, but it's pretty much the same view. Whereas John's is quite different, okay? And, and we'll see that in a minute. It's the same storyline, but a different approach, all right? Let me say that again. Here's another one of those critical, critical concepts that you have to get when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Most people just read them, I suppose, and you should, uh, devotionally in the sense, well, let me just read them through. Yes, I'm blessed by this. I'm blessed by the Sermon on the Mount, and you should be. But that, that's just scratching the surface. So when we, when we look at them, we're, we're realizing that there's, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a structure to them. When you look at Matthew, for example, it's built around five major discourses. So the narrative is built around five major discourses. Here again, I'll side note and say this is the advantage of commentaries. As you're studying and working at your exegetical skills, you have a good commentary there, and you're working on that. And, and this sort of thing is starting to come out. Uh, I still use commentaries to this day, uh, studying for 40 years, having a seminary degree. Uh, I'm a big fan of all sorts of resources because I'm not smart enough to reinvent the wheel, okay? So I just take advantage of what is there. Here's, an, here's another example of how critical structure is. The, the way these authors gathered the material and then put it together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When two people look at the same event, usually there's a variance of opinion, isn't there? Yeah, not all the details are exact. That's actually a good thing in a, in a, in a court of law, from what I understand. An exact representation from different individuals usually is not the best because it may insinuate collaboration beforehand and de deception. But as we look at the Gospels, we realize in their, in their similarities there, there is differences, but the strength of it is that they all follow the same storyline according to the inspiration of the script. For example, here's, here's John's structure, right? In order to understand this, well, what's John's theme? Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life through his name. So when you approach John's gospel, then you're, you're realizing that it doesn't cover a lot of the events in Jesus' life, but it, it covers some miracles, seven or so, and it has these I am statements, but if you'll notice... There's major discourses, theological discourses woven around these miracles or statements. And that's absolutely critical because John uh, did not depend on the other writers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are similar. They, they may have borrowed from each other to some extent. We'll talk about that in a minute. And again, if you want to get into that, you just go in the area of, of canonicity. So that's another distinctive. And this is where a good New Testament introduction is very, very helpful, okay? A good New Testament introduction, because in that you can see how uh, the different Gospels are laid out, and other books of the Scripture for that matter. I recommend uh, Carson, uh, Moo, and Morris's, and I'll give you these resources at the end. So hopefully at this point, you're starting to grasp, okay, so these are some of the distinctives, all right? There's overlap of materials in the Gospels, and there's some exclusions, isn't there? For example, um, there's a nativity in Matthew and Luke, right? The chronological chronologies and then the birth of Jesus. But uh, notice there's none in Mark or John. Why? Well, here again, this is where you begin to think there's a reason for that. What is it? And this is where you begin to understand this, the structure of the gospel, why it's written, who's the audience, and so forth. All but 31 verses in Mark uh, or have parallels in uh, Matthew and Luke. Again, this information is in your book, and if you've read the chapter, hopefully you have. Uh, you, you've comprehended this to a point. Another thing about the Gospels, um, as they're written, they were written for the needs of different communities. For example, Matthew 
basically to the Jews, clarifying Jesus of Nazareth, the claimed Messiah. So the, so the information is arranged in such a way to substantiate that claim and, and drive home the point. That's a, maybe a bit of an overgeneralization, but it is basically the reason. Or Mark um, just, just appears to be a running history. That's that, from what I gather, and here again, <laughs> I'm not an expert on canonicity. You go to Michael Kruger, uh, you just type his name in YouTube, and you'll have all kinds of things coming up. Uh, very helpful. He's a high priority scholar, but he's very easy to understand. There's a sequence in the, in the writings. And uh, when we think about this, Mark probably was written first, okay? And then later, uh, Matthew and Luke, who uh, appeared to have borrowed from Mark and other oral traditions, obviously. Now, there's debate on that, and if you read the text, you'll realize that, that to a point, but that's sort of a, a general statement. But here again, John was independent. John was written later, probably in the 90s. Mark might have been written, I don't know, in the 50s or so, and the other two in the 60s. Uh, but that's, that's debatable. You can look at a good uh, New Testament introduction for that. So as we're thinking on these distinctives, we're saying, well, what, what it meant then, what it means now, uh, and that brings up the, the question, is here is where context helps, okay? So let me define context from the dictionary, and then I'm going to define it, uh, let's just say, experientially. So according to the American Heritage High School Dictionary, the part of a text or statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its meaning, the circumstance in which an event occurs in its setting. And, and we use this term a lot, context. In other words, we just don't pull texts out and make them mean what we want. We, we want to see their historical background, where they fit in the text, what the theological background is, etc. So I'll read this again. The part of a text or statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its meaning. The circumstances in which an event occurs. American Heritage High School Dictionary. There's not too many days when you don't see me fired up, okay? And uh, all you would have to do is see me in this situation, maybe uh, ministry I help, and there I'm on a rant. And someone would say, well, what's, what's he all fired up about? Well, he just heard something from fake news, and now he's on one of his political rants. So that describes the context, right? So if you would see me off a lawnmower there, just really getting into it, hopefully in a controlled way, but a very passionate way, the context is I heard something on fake news, I realized that you know, already people are going through my thinking, no, that's not correct. And then uh, my, what little bit of history I know, the repertoire of that is challenging it. So that's, that's the context of my emotions there and what I'm doing. But translate that concept to the Gospels, and that's very, very critical for us. So culture, culture studies now will help us to understand the context, all right? Here's, here's a classic example. And at this point, his disciples came and marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Now, that is at the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. So uh, cu culturally, that was, let's just say, uh, pretty dramatic, as far as I understand. So that, that would be something that, as you're studying, you'd say, boy, there's, there's some cultural implications to that. Or, or perhaps when you're back at the, at the birth narratives and you're, you're understanding the different phases of Jewish betrothal, in that culture. Or you may be wondering why the, the woman that wanted to be healed wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. There's, there was a reason for that. So cult, culture studies are very, very helpful 
as, as we approach uh, the study of the gospel. And again, we're, we're just going through these distinctives. They're all in your book, okay? And, and I, I want you to just be looking at them and saying, okay, there's a lot here, which there is, but uh, I'm just, let's just say, feeding you this so you'll integrate it into your thinking that when we get to the approach, these, these things uh, at least are somewhat formative in your thinking. Um, form of teaching, very critical as we approach the text, whether it's a birth narrative, whether it's the Sermon on the Mount, whether it's the understanding of a miracle, whether it's the dialogue with the rich young ruler, whether it's the Olivet Discourse, the parables, and we will actually have a lesson on that in the future. So here, just briefly, are some of the examples uh, of Jesus' teaching. And you're, you're, most people are uh, familiar with the parable, and he often used parables. And I won't steal the thunder from uh, the one who is going to explain that, but there's usually just one main truth and it's taking from maybe the agricultural realm or something like that. But he also used um, hyperbola to teach. And hyperbola is exaggeration, isn't it? Frankly, that's a problem with some of us preachers that we do tend to exaggerate a little bit. Not Jesus. <laughs> so we have to be careful in that. Uh, but hyperbola drives the point home. For example, here, uh, Matthew 5.29, and if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for you whole body to be thrown into hell. We obviously know that's an hyperbola, all right? Interestingly, there's people in church history that may have taken an application of that literally. And I can think of one. I won't go there now. So <laughs> we have to be very, very careful when he was using exaggeration or hyperbole. Uh, sometimes uh, he uses proverbs, doesn't he? For example, on the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, other, other times he uses similes and metaphor. And we know what that is, the like, like, or as, Okay. And here again, this is, this is part of methodical Bible study, this, the subcategory under hermeneutics, that as we approach the text, we're, we're examining the way it's portrayed so that we can understand it. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you to you sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be shrewd as serpent and as innocent as doves. Uh, other, uh, let's just say, uh, ways of teaching is uh, poetry, Questions, all right? And, and again, these, these are not novel <coughs> to necessarily Jesus, but they were just literary techniques of the time used. And, and that's why I, I just want to um, I encourage you so much in this that, that you realize that this is language, Okay, and the, and the key to light, as I've said earlier, is understanding more and more how to process the language. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnate word. But we know our understanding of him comes through the scripture. Here's a, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the way of questions, I think that's the Socratic way. I think... Um, Yes, but he said yes, and when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From what do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax from the sons or from strangers? Irony uh, is another way that he teaches. So as, as you approach the text, you're, you're going to look at the type of teaching, okay? You know, when we looked at the epistles, it was, it was pretty much ideological, all right? Maybe a little bit of biographical, biographical mix, but it was mostly ideological. Here's the statement. I want to explain it or prove it or defend it. And that's not to say that's not subliminary to this. But that's these, these uh, seven or eight items here, and they're in your book, um, 
are very critical in approaching the text as you look at the different ways that Jesus taught. Now, under this theme of context, that's what we're developing here, um, historical context, general and specific. Um, some of the teachings, we know the context, and others we don't. Okay? So, so back to the illustration that I gave, you may be standing there watching me work, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden I, I start to go into a fury <laughs> because you've, you've known what happened. I was exposed to some sort of truth that, or half-truth, put it that way, that made me livid, et cetera, et cetera. But by the same token, you may see me walking down the street later on just really mumbling to myself and growling, and you say, what's wrong with you? Because you don't know the context of the action that I elicited. So the challenge that we face is some of the teaching that we will look into as we study the Gospels, we, we know the context. Others, um, we don't. Here, here's a good example. Uh, the miracle at Canaan, right? We, we knew the context. That's the first major miracle. Um, we know where it was in the harmony. It's very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Very early. But here's, here's where the application of these techniques is very critical. What's, what's the significance of it? Okay? So again, back to what I sort of uh, fed you with earlier, a harmony of the gospel, looking down the corridor, the events lined up, the teachings lined up under subtitles in the, in the sense of what was Jesus doing at this point? What was his major emphasis? Was he just giving general teaching? Or now, as it shows later on, he's just focusing on the disciples. You, all, all you, you get this all in good harmony or commentary, so it really matures your understanding but back to what I was saying about when we, when, we, when we know the text and the context is very helpful because it gives us, a, uh, we can deduce the significance of it more accurately. And here's what uh, Shepard says in his Harmony of the Gospel, which is an excellent one. He said, and I quote him, he made plain his glory, the glory of the preexistent word and the only begotten son of God by this first miracle. Now, there's much more to that. And if you have the mind for it, this is where you would get D.A. Carson's commentary, which is an academic commentary, and he would really get into an explanation of the discourse. And there are different levels of commentaries, all right? There's devotional ones, there's basic ones, there's expositional ones like John MacArthur's, there's, there's time-tested ones like Matthew Henry. And this is why as you begin to accumulate your library, you're going to use different types of commentaries. So I, I don't want the preacher to be always using a devotional commentary. I, I don't have a problem with that when it's applicational time. But the, the preacher should be using uh, Carson, Morris, Moo, those types of people to, to their academic commentaries that really get into the text. So this, again, is under the subject of just understanding uh, the, the, the culture, the background, the context. And uh, just, just remember that um, these stories were, were transmitted orally, okay? So, so at the end, at the ascension, as these stories began to be transmitted, and probably even were transmitted, uh, I'm sure, before that, that these words and deeds were, were transmitted. And uh, this is what's been put together. Again, Mark probably written first, Matthew and Luke, John independent, and they had access to other materials as well. Now here's another distinctive that's, again, very, very critical. It's, it's not just us looking at the Gospels and what Jesus is teaching, the context of what he's teaching, where it fits in the harmony of the gospel, the type of literature he's using to communicate his point. But what's the author's perspective? Okay? What's everything's written aforetime? Written for our patience and learning that we may have hope. Okay? So I'm a firm believer 
in the validity of the Old Testament. I'm a firm believer that it, the, to understand the New Testament and vice versa, we must have both Testaments. I'm a firm believer in a very aggressive study of Old Testament quotes used in the New Testament. So, so you're getting my point, all right? It's absolutely critical to us. We've sometimes sort of, let's just say, brush it off and says, well, that's, there's too much there. It's kind of complicated, and um, I don't want to fool with it. And that's a fatal mistake. And the, the reason I, I say that is because a lot of the authors, let's just say, vision and developing their vision has roots in the Old Testament. Here's a classic example. And uh, again, I'll read this from your book. You can read it later. It's, again, this, this was pretty challenging. This is, this is a, a difficult book in some way, a very good book, but even for me, um, uh, with all my education, it's, I got to work at it. So don't get discouraged. But uh, he, here to illustrate this point about Mark, Mark's gospel, for example, is especially interested in explaining the nature of Jesus Messiahship in the light of Isaiah's second exodus. Although Mark knows that the Messiah is the strong son of God who moves through Galilee with power and compassion. He also knows that Jesus repeatedly kept his Messiahship hidden. The reason for this silence is that only Jesus understands the true nature of his messianic destiny, that of the suffering servant who conquers through death. End of quote. Don't leave, okay? Don't leave. Don't check out mentally, please. Because remember what I've said from the outset, how critical it is to wrestle with your text yourself, accumulating these distinctives, but using helps, okay? Using helps. So that brings us now, as we've looked at some of these distinctives, you, you can go through your book and get them, uh, and how, how to look, how to look at the text. And, and again, this, in the 20 minutes I've left, this is a, a, almost impossible to accomplish because this, this is another whole discipline under hermeneutics, that of methodical Bible study, which I've made, made a little bit uh, mention about approaching literature in my last lecture. But for our purpose, we can say, um, and again, this is in your book, that how to look, we look horizontally, and we look, or rather horizontally, and we look vertically as we're approaching the text. So um, because I've said the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were written not independently, but there's interdependence, that then you're able to look at the different pericopes, which are, and he uses this term in your book, the individual sayings or teachings of Jesus in the other Gospels. So now you're able to realize that some of the teachings are in the other Gospels, and then you can line them up and compare them. Not, not just per se to fill in the blanks, which, isn't, which is okay, it's a good thing, but to compare them so that you will understand um, the 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 different contexts, and you'll understand the different distinctives of the way um, other authors recorded the same event, and I'll illustrate that in a minute. So let me run that by again. So as you're approaching the text, you're not just looking horizontally in the sense that, that you're, you're saying all these tools and what does it mean, but you're also looking vertically then, as we'll see in a minute. But as we're looking horizontally, you're saying, okay, uh, I want to compare it with the other Gospels and see what different distinctives there are and the similarities, as your book quite essentially talked about. It's work. It's work. It's work. It's discipline. But if, you, if you're going to get light, if you're going to get light, you got to dig, you got to study, you got to pursue it with just the basic tools uh, that we have. So uh, now that we're looking at this, how to look, the author of the, of the book, authors too, uh, three suggested principles, which are very, very helpful uh, as we're looking. And um, one is, as you look at these authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
uh, they selected material for their gospel. They didn't write everything. And you know that from the statement in John where he says it's, uh, basically that all the books in the world couldn't hold what Jesus said and did. Now, that's hyperbole, but there was a lot he did. And all you have to do is pres- uh, just look at the book of John and realize how many events it actually covers, very few. But it's, it's the discourses that make it up. But they, they also arranged it in a certain way. Okay, this is, this is where I, I'm hardcore on the doctrine of inspiration. That not just the, the, what they said, but the arrangement, uh, the, the syntax, everything is inspired by God and, gui- and guided by him. It wasn't haphazard. And you may say, well, I'm, I'm not sure that's, not, that's a bit of a stretch. Well, look at some of Paul's situations in the book of Romans where he asks questions. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I made this allusion before. Make an oito, right? I think I've said that right, right, Jonathan? Uh, no way. That's a very strong negative. So they arranged it and uh, as I gave you an example earlier, Matthew's arrangement is around the five major discourses. So all the narrative goes around that. And as you study the discourses, you ask, well, what, where, are, where and when are they? What was the context of the Olivet Discourse? But they adapted it to their theme, okay? So the, your book gives you a good example, the cursing of the fig tree. So Matt, Mark's use of this was for a theological purpose, the judgment on Judaism, whereas Matthew's use of it was just to strengthen the faith. So these, these are some distinctives that are part of the discipline of hermeneutics, all right? And if I said, well, name some, you may have trouble. But again, you, you have the book here. As I have often say, continue to say, the church was gracious enough to provide those, so please use them, okay? And uh, you just read and read and read. The author at the end uh, makes a very uh, profound point, and he says... He made this statement in the beginning, but he concludes the whole discussion on the distinctives of the Gospels with the the proper understanding of the concept of the kingdom of God. And there's different terminology used. There's the kingdom of God, and then there's the kingdom of of heaven. And they're not necessarily interchangeable principles. That's another study in itself. But suffice it to say that as Mark says in um, Mark 1.15, and saying that time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, all right? So he's announcing the rule and reign of Jesus Christ at that phase of progressive revelation and redemption. Underline that up on the PowerPoint. Because... The kingdom of God has always been with us. It's always there. It's always ruling. It's always manifesting its power. It's, it's inaccurate, in my opinion, to look at the Old Testament and say, well, the kingdom of God was on hold. No way. <laughs> it was doing what God said it would do. But in this particular phase of the revelation of the kingdom of God, we understand what was happening, the incarnation and the resurrection, death and resurrection. So very, very critical that we are uh, eschatological thinkers, okay? We're not just thinking today, this is it. No, no, Uh, the eschaton, although we live as rightfully uh, expounded and taught in this context here in this church and have great obligations to the culture that we live in and promoting the lordship of Jesus Christ, we are still eschatological people, aren't we? That, that our hope is, our final hope is the future, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's that tension of the already and not yet. We live in that tension, right? So already I am justified by faith and righteous in the sight of God 
and have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ given to me. But if, but if you follow me, a couple minutes even, you could be going, what, I saw you do that, or I saw you, I look into your head, I saw you think that. And I said, that's true, because uh, I'm justified now, but not glorified yet. There's the tension. The already and the not yet is a very, very essential hermeneutical principle that not just bears itself uh, in the study of the Gospels, but the whole New Testament, particularly in Paul's teachings, the already, already justified, but not yet glorified. So the distinctives, uh, I hope that you've grasped some of them. And now I have 14 minutes left because we started at 5.04 or 4.04 and it is now 10.04 or 10.05. So I do have 14 minutes left. And I just want to uh, make a suggested approach, okay? Because again, we, we don't have the time in just one lecture to continue to get into the different literary aspects of methodical Bible study. We did touch some of those, structure, type of teaching, uh, analysis of, of the text in its context, etc. They're good things, and, but you, you have to mature that. Just remember, Bible study is not a sprint, it's a marathon, okay? You have to work at it. You got to work at it. We will help. I got to work at it. And as I've said, it's not the same as preaching in the sense that as you listen to preaching, you're listening to what your pastor has labored over and distilled to, to shoot at you, thus saith the Lord, from the heavenly throne. But as you approach the text, you're saying, okay, God, it's, i got to start the wrestling match. So here's, here's a suggested approach. And as I mentioned earlier on a rather humorous note, if I go off the rails here, the dean of this uh, category is Jonathan. He can just raise his hand and Matt can shut me down, all right? But this, this is the reality of it. And, and when I just want to say this to encourage you because many times when people approach methodical Bible study hermeneutics, all right, I'm going to do this, I'm going to study this, and I don't need anything, and then they crash. Because even the experts, these guys, are recommending resources, aren't they? Yes. To assist us in studying. So here's what I would do. First, I, I read the text. Okay, let's say we're going to do Matthew. So I'd read the whole book several times. Just read it. Or, or maybe I'm just going to study the Sermon on the Mount. I would read the, the, the whole text and then study the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, various translations. And then I would go to background studies, all right? Culture, purpose, theme, authorship, audience. Um, so I would break that up into two things, two categories. Culture, um, and your book gives you this, Backgrounds of Early Christianity by Ferguson. All right, so it gives you an insight into what the culture was like in the first century. Uh, Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, uh, Joachim Jeremias. In fact, um, that was mentioned last week. That's very helpful. Um, I found this one very helpful, the IVP Bible background commentary, Keener. All right, that's, that's helpful. So there's, there's multitudinous books on this subject. So first you're reading the text, just reading it, different translations. Then you're saying, okay, let, let me just start reading some background studies so that I get a grasp on culture. But then I'm also reading an introduction to the New Testament, as I mentioned earlier, Carson, Moo, or Morris. So that as I'm approaching the text, he's talking about who the author is. If there's any debate, usually there's debate on some. And then he talks about the theme of the book. What's the big idea? And this will take various forms. And probably, depending on the level of the, the book that's assisting you, uh, it, it can get deeper. There's some basic ones that are very helpful, but this is a scholarly one. But it's also going to start unpacking some of the things that I've talked about, the, the structure. Well, this is the way John's book is laid out around the miracles, around the I am statements, because his theology is 
He wants to verify verse 1 1. See? And that's why these are very, very helpful. And what they do for me is they continue to sharpen the skills that I should have, okay? And that's, that's why I'm encouraging you to use them because these things that I've talked about, may, maybe you're, you say, well, I'm, I don't fully understand a parable, but yet you're using John MacArthur's commentary on um, Matthew, which is quite good, maybe different, a theolo- lot little theolo- theologically different than what you would think, but quite good. And then he's interpreting the parable for you, and you say, hey, now I understand this. Is one main truth. It's just the application of one main truth, illustrated by an agrarian setting or something from the first century. The next thing I would do is look at the harmony, look at the harmony, look at the harmony. I can't stress this enough. And I don't, I don't hear this much from preachers. I, I don't know if it's just passe. Is that the right word for, for passed off, Ethan? Okay, Andy's saying that's it. But you don't, you don't hear that too much because in the day, in the day of A.T. Robertson, the late 1900s and the giants of when, when, when grammar was just exploding and all that sort of thing, this, he wrote probably the, the, the classic one. Now, it's been tweaked a little bit as time went on, but, oh, the harmony. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the Christ of the Gospels by Shepherd. The Christ of the Gospels by Shepherd. But you can just get a basic harmony, and there's probably one right in your, in your... This one has commentary with it. That's why that's so excellent. And many others do. Dwight Pentecost wrote an excellent one as well. Again, this is a dispensational camp, but very, very good. Uh, but your study Bible has a harmony in the back. And then I would say, yeah, I'm getting warm now. I want to I get a little bit clearer on the structural outline of, of the components, the way it's all put together. And these principles apply to any of the books, that, any of the genre that you're going to study. But I'm just using them for the Gospels. Uh, and I would either look at a study Bible or... Um, Talk Through the Bible by Wilkinson and Boa is excellent. And again, it's, it's maybe a different, theolo- little different theolo- theologically over art, but not unorthodox, but it lays out the structure very, very well and very clear. It's, it's, mid, it's mid-level, but I, I can't emphasize, that's a great book. You guys had that at Word of Life. We didn't have it. Um, I think you did, Ethan. Um, because why, why is this critical? And again, to quote Charles Ryrie from his, his study Bible, the structure and style of the gospel are different from those of the synoptics. It contains no parables, only seven miracles, five of which are not recorded elsewhere, and many personal interviews. The author emphasizes the physical actuality of Jesus' hunger, thirst, weariness, pain, etc. End of quote. Okay? So that, that's why uh, that is so, so helpful. But now, as you approach the text, then, then what, what do we do now that we're going to approach the text itself? You have read it. You're, you're filling your mind with resources. Maybe you're as smart as Jonathan, where you're able to deduce the structure and all that sort of thing on your own. I'm not. I admit that. I admit that. Or Matt. Those, those guys, you know, I have a seminary degree, but... I, I, I'm just not that intelligent, so I just use all these resources. So you can use them to a different level. Don't be ashamed to do it. Because you want to know what it means, right? Yeah. So the next thing I do is I approach the text, and here I have my commentary with me, and I'm saying, okay, what is this? What is the first section after the chronology of Matthew? It's a narrative. So, all right, what did we learn about narrative? Well, we learned about the importance of characters, scenes, dialogue, interpretive skills. So I approached the text with those already in mind to try to exegete the text. Or maybe I'm in the section where there's parables and and you're there looking at the parable of the sower. So you've already looked at the structural analysis. You already looked at the harmony and you realize why it is there. See, that's critical. Not just what does it mean, but why. Why is it located in that part of the book? See, and that's where, again, good commentary, um, good background, 
gives you the theological reason as you're following the life of Jesus and why the inspired author says, you know, we're going to put that there because I want to make a point, see? Um, and as you look at the other types of literature, the didactic literature, the teaching literature, then you apply, hey, why is Jesus using a hyperbola here? So what do you do then? Uh, usually as you deal with a section, and it, this applies as well. Uh, i got three minutes. Uh, the epistle... The epistles, you, you exegete them, and then you write a synopsis, right? To help you, that's a the synopsis, is a summary statement. But you can do the same here. As you deal with the text, you come up with a synopsis. So you've looked at the birth narrative, um, Matthew 1, 18 to 25. And you've come up with a synopsis of the events right? It's announcement to Joseph, but then, but then you interpret it. You say, well, what's the significance of it? Well, the significance of it is here's the promise fulfilled, and here's the reality of the virgin birth. And then you correlate it, because you say, whoa, wait a second. This is not one of those springs that you can take out of the trampoline. You know who I'm talking about, Ethan, right? Yes. Yeah. The, this one you can't. There's one particular, whatever he is, I don't know what he is anymore, but he made that statement. Well, some of these theological principles, you know, it's like a trampoline, you just take the spring out. No, <laughs> this isn't one we can take it out. This is essential to our faith. Even though when you make your initial confession of faith, you may not understand it or whatever. No, no, we mature into that. We've, under, we, we've said that before. Because, and I correlate that into my worldview and my understanding and the necessity of it because of original sin. It's absolutely essential. And then finally, well, we apply it. Remember, um, it's a marathon. Keep adding your skills. We're just laying a foundation. Um, if you've listened to the lecture and you say, you know what, I'm on Mars. Well, then start over, read the, read the text, get yourself a good commentary, pick out a gospel, study it, and um, like any other skill, as you use it, you'll be surprised what your brain will recollect. Most of my life in construction, I was a grunt, which means I set forms, I finished concrete, I dug, I shoveled mud, and somebody else was always on the machine, the backhoe or the dozer. But I found it quite interesting, years and years of watching these people, when I started getting onto these machines, I'm by no means an operator, but it wasn't long I was using them. Now again, I'm, I'm not an operator, I can use them, but so it was, it was actually just observation. Subliminal observation. So for you again, I'm encouraging you in this, don't walk away discouraged. Just say, this is great stuff. I got to dig. I want to pursue. I want to run with it. Amen.